Welkom bij Oude Verstoting Overwinnen. Vandaag gaan we kijken naar een presentatie van Dr. Craig Childress. Uh, hij geeft veel meer diepgang in wat is er nu eigenlijk aan de hand. Want we zien het wel, parental alienation. Hij geeft meer inzicht in hoe zit het nou in de psychiatrie, hoe zit het in het DSM. Want er zijn heel veel onwaarheden en er is heel veel onduidelijkheid. Maar eigenlijk zijn alle tools er al voor hulpverleners om het te zien, om er wat aan te doen. Dus hij geeft alle signalen aan, hij geeft aan waar het vandaan komt. Hij geeft aan wat gebeurt er in de verstotende ouder, wat ge gebeurt er bij het kind, wat gebeurt er ook in jou. Dus hij geeft heel veel tips en tools, dus we gaan gelijk beginnen. Je gaat heel veel aan hebben. Neem aantekeningen. Today we are very pleased to have Dr. Childress speak about the topic of attachment and parental alienation in a revolutionary way. And just very briefly, according to I was reading Helen Fisher, who is a professor at Rutgers University, and she's a biological anthropologist, she talks about having three brain systems, one for lust, a system for romantic love, and a system or drive towards attachment. And so as young children, when they're growing up, that secure bond between a parent is correlated with emotional well-being. And Dr. Childress is here today because what haps, happens when that is ruptured? What happens when there's a divorce? So without further ado, let's, I'll turn it over to Dr. Childress. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Barbara. Um, let me start by thanking uh, California Southern University for the opportunity to talk today uh, about an issue that I believe is um, very important to uh, a set of children and families going through what's called high conflict divorce uh, that involves, um, traditionally it's been called parental alienation and it involves um, a child's rejection of a relationship with a normal range and affectionately available parent because of the distorted pra parenting practices of the other parent during the, the high conflict divorce and it's a very tragic situation and it's a situation that's not particularly well understood um, at this point. This is a companion lecture to uh, my previous talk on the theoretical foundations uh, for an attachment-based model of uh, the construct of parental alienation. And in this particular uh, talk today, I'm going to be addressing diagnostic issues and treatment issues related to an attachment-based model of parental alienation. But uh, to begin with here, I'd like to just review some of the theoretical foundations uh, for a more thorough uh, discussion of that. You can go back to my other previous talk. The um, construct of parental alienation uh, was first put forward uh, by a psychiatrist, Richard Gardner, back in the 1980s, who identified this process involved in family dynamic involved in high conflict divorce that he called parental alienation syndrome. It was a set of anecdotal clinical indicators that he uh, identified related to one parent inducing the child's rejection of the other parent. And since the time that Gardner put forth the idea of parental alienation syndrome, it's received a lot of controversy. There are supporters for it. But there's also a, a number of detractors. Uh, it was labeled junk science. It didn't have a scientific foundation to it. Um, he also put some forward some ideas about false allegations of sexual abuse that also generated considerable controversy. The construct of parental alienation syndrome, from my perspective, is a failed paradigm. In the 30 years since it's first been introduced, it has failed to solve the problem associated with parental alienation and high conflict divorce. And from my perspective, while Gardner was accurate in identifying a clinical construct, he too quickly abandoned established psychological principles and constructs in defining what was going on. And so he proposed, to, in my view, too quickly this idea of a new, new syndrome out there that was not based in any established psychological principles. The, and because of that, we have been unable to leverage the construct of parental alienation syndrome to solve the problem. And so over 30 years, we are still mired in um, a lot of controversy and a lot of difficulty for the targeted parents who are rejected by their 
by their children. Garner's model of, uh, for parental alienation syndrome is, in my view, a failed theoretical paradigm because it does not establish what the processes are within um, established and accepted psychological principles and constructs that we can then use to understand what's happening in the family. It's a failed diagnostic paradigm because his anecdotal set of eight clinical indicators, things like a campaign of denigration or uh, borrowed scenarios, don't have any foundation in any other theoretical principles. And so whether or not it's present or absence is open to debate and oftentimes uh, leads to the third problematic issues re regarding parental alienation syndrome is that it's a failed legal paradigm because it requires that we litigate whether or not parental alienation is occurring. And that can be tremendously expensive for the targeted parents. Uh, it can involve years of litigation trying to prove parental alienation in court. And it can only be proven in the most egregious cases. So very insidious and subtle forms, are we are unable to prove it in the, the legal system. And having to prove it in the legal system unduly burdens targeted parents so that many of them cannot afford to do that and so then lose a relationship with their children. And it's also a failed the, uh, therapeutic paradigm because even if we accept parental alienation syndrome, it doesn't guide us as to what it is and how to treat it. And so um, from my perspective, when I first ran into this about a decade, Heel interessant wat hij aangeeft, van het is een falen gefaal, model. Want ook al wordt het erkend en je ziet nu, we, zitten nu in tweede, we leven nu in 2023, dat het eindelijk richting erkend gaat. Er is een expertrapport, oude verstoting, gemaakt in 2021. Dan nog, wat doe je ermee? Hoe ga je het aanpakken? Dus hij heeft hier terecht de kritiek, dat is nu nog steeds niet. Van wat, als je het helemaal vaststelt, wat ga je eraan doen? Ja, keer ago en decided that this was an issue that needed resolution. I went back and to the foundations and began to redefine what the construct of parental alienation is, but from within standard and accepted psychological principles and constructs. Now, my background is in attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, as well as early childhood mental health. And in that early childhood mental health, um, I have a background in attachment theory uh, and the attachment system. So it became, when I first ran into this, it was pretty obvious to me that this is a distortion to the child's attachment system. A child rejecting a, an affectional bond with a normal range and affectionately available parent is a problem in the attachment system. And then I also recognized in the symptom display, the, um, I'm a family systems therapist, so the cross-generational coalition, uh, the child's triangulation and spousal conflict, as well as some key personality disorder symptoms in the child's symptom display, particularly um, an absence of empathy and uh, splitting, which are both characteristic of narcissistic borderline personalities. And I'm, I'm seeing those in a child's symptoms. Dus, uh, hij geeft dus aan, hij is uh, systeemtherapeut. Hij ziet het als een hertingsstel problematiek. En dat klopt ook. Normaal gesproken zal het kind altijd hechten aan beide ouders. In dit geval gebeurt dat dus niet. Hij ziet twee dingen, twee elementen. Gebrek aan empathie. Dus dan krijg je opeens een kind wat de andere ouder compleet kan afwijzen, maar ook totaal geen vroeging voelt. Dus geen enkele vorm van empathie. Dat, valt, dat viel hem gelijk op. I'm going, uh oh, and we have this enmeshed relationship with the allied and supposedly favored parent. And so there's personality disorder dynamics involved. And so I set about understanding an attachment-based model or a parental alienation from an attachment-based framework. And uh, the attachment-based model that I'll be talking about today and in the previous lecture acknowledges the clinical acumen, the accuracy of Richard Gardner in identifying something, but it goes back and reformulates the, what, the what he identified as parental alienation from within standard uh, and established psychological principles and constructs. So an attachment-based model of parental alienation returns to the theoretical foundations that define the construct of parental alienation and corrects the earlier limitations by redefining the construct um, from within 
established principles and constructs. And as such, it represents a new paradigm for understanding and defining the construct of parental alienation and high conflict divorce. The, so let me now um, talk about the, the paradigm shift. Here's a model or a diagram for what we'll be talking about uh, in terms of an attachment-based model. It starts with the disorganized, preoccupied attachment of the alienating parent. Uh, and that's technical, but that's the attachment system of the, the alienating parent is categorized, or the category of how we would define it is disorganized, uh, preoccupied. And that's what led to the formation of the narcissistic and borderline personality traits that we later see as the adult, but it also involves an attachment trauma. And so there's trauma networks in there as well that are both being activated. So we have two lines moving down in the dynamic, one having to do with uh, the personality disorder manifestations of the alienating parent, the other having to do with the attachment trauma. And ze geeft hier ook aan de verstotende ouder heeft gewoon een persoonlijkheid stoornis. Die heeft zelf ook een hechtingsprobleem. What's going to happen in the attachment trauma is there's going to be a reenactment in the current family relationships of that attachment trauma. And that's going to be critical to understanding both the diagnosis and its treatment. That we're dealing with a trauma issue here. From the personality disorder side, we're getting an enactment of the um, narcissistic inadequacy, fears, and the, narciss and the borderline uh, fears of abandonment. And so those are beginning to distort the family processes. Um, de geschiedenis herhaalt zich, dus de verstotende ouder heeft zelf ook hechtingsproblematiek. Die is zelf ook opgevoed, opgegroeid in een, uh, in een gezin waarbij de ouders ook aan een stoornis lijden. Dus het wordt doorgegeven generatie op generatie. Dus jij zelf ook. Hè? Hoe ben jij terechtgekomen bij een ouder? Uh, hoe ben jij terechtgekomen bij een ouder uh, of bij een partner die jouw kinderen gaat verstoten? Waarschijnlijk heb jij zelf dus ook zo'n slechte opvoeding gehad. In understanding uh, this complicated uh, or complex psychological dynamic, it's valuable to have, um, approach it with some degree of organization. And the way I've organized an understanding of it is along three levels. There's the surface level, which involves the family systems dynamics and what's happening in the family systems. Beneath that is the underlying personality disorder issues that are driving the family systems processes. Underneath the, the personality disorder level is the attachment system uh, dysfunctions that are driving the personality disorder that are driving the family systems. So as we uh, discuss an attachment-based model of parental alienation, it's helpful to kind of get clarity as to which level we're talking about so we don't get all confused all over the place. The, um, and so the attachment system drives the narcissistic borderline personality processes, which then drive the family dynamics. So at the family systems level, the surface level, what's going on is the inability of the family to transition from an intact family structure to a separated family structure. And this is classic family systems work, that when the family has difficulty transitioning, for whatever um, challenges they face, symptoms emerge within the family to help balance it and maintain homeostasis within the family. So, and I discuss this a lot of times with my clients, just because there's a divorce doesn't mean the family is disappearing. What we're moving, we're transitioning from an intact family structure that's united by the marriage to a separated family structure that's now united by the child. But the family is still there because the child serves a uniting function. The more conflict in the parents, the more conflict in the child trying to serve that uniting function. So what we would hope is that the parents can reduce their conflict so the child can serve that uniting function in a peaceful way and we can move from an intact family structure to a separated family structure. Nice. The problem that's emerging within this construct of parental alienation is uh, the triangulation of the child into that spousal conflict through the formation of what's called a cross-generational parent-child coalition of the child with a narcissistic borderline parent. 
The, and here's Salvador Mnuchin talking about that cross-generational correlation. The boundary between the parental subsystem and the child becomes diffuse. And the boundary around the parent-child triad, which should be diffuse, becomes inappropriately rigid. This type of structure is called a rigid triangle. The rigid triangle can also take the form of a stable coalition. One of the parents joins the child in a rigidly bounded cross-generational coalition against the other parent. That's essentially what parental alienation is. It's a cross-generational coalition of one parent with the child against the other parent. The little tweaking difference is that the parent who's in the coalition has a narcissistic borderline personality disorder. And that transmutes that coalition into a particularly malignant and virulent form that is lethal to the other parent's relationship with the child because of the severe pathology of the narcissistic borderline parent. Jay Haley, another preeminent family systems theorist, also describes this cross-generational coalition. The people responding to each other in the triangle are not peers, but one of them is from a different generation from the other two, so the parent and the child. In the process of their interaction together, the person of one generation forms a coalition with the person of the other generation against his peer. By co coalition is meant a process of joint action which is against the third person. The coalition between the two persons is denied. That is, there is a certain behavior which indicates a coalition which, when it is queried, will be denied as a coalition. In essence, and Jay, so Salvador Mnuchin calls it a rigid triangle, Jay Haley calls it a, a perverse triangle because it's crossing generational boundaries and it's never crossed generational boundaries. So in essence, the perverse triangle is one in which the separation of generations is breached in a covert way. When this occurs as a repetitive pattern, the symptom will be pathological. So rather than Gardner's model that says it's a new syndrome, oh, no, no, it's standard family systems kind of stuff. It's just a cross-generational coalition with a narcissistic borderline parent. Um, oh, there's his quote. So the addition of parental narcissistic and or borderline pathology to a cross-generational parent-child coalition transmutes the coalition into a particularly virulent and malignant form of the family dynamic that acts to terminate the child's relationship with the other parent. So now at the personality disorder level uh, of things, one of the things uh, that's important to understand is the equivalency of the narcissistic borderline process. And so I'm going to be using those terms together. They're not actually sort of separate personality dynamics. Kernberg noted that. If you drop down to the attachment system level, we form a, um, expectations about ourselves in relationship and others in relationship. For both the narcissistic and borderline process, uh, self is inadequate. I'm inadequate in the relationship, and my expectations of other is that I'm going to be abandoned. The difference... Die is heel belangrijk. Dus de narcistische ouder, die dus uh, wil dat het kind de andere ouder gaat verstoten, heeft eigenlijk een lege kern van ik ben niet goed genoeg. En die heeft ook de gedachte dat het eigen kind hem of haar ook gaat verlaten. Dus de kern is... Ik ben leeg, ik ga worden verlaten. Gigantische angst komt uit de kindertijd. En het wordt nu weer opnieuw uitgespeeld. Is the borderline experiences that directly and gets very chaotic in their emotions. The narcissist has developed a narcissistic defense against that experience. And so I'm grandiose and so they reject others. So, Kernberg here. Ja, dus uh, je borderline, je hebt narcisme. Cluster B, DSM5, als je gaat kijken... Ik heb het idee dat het gewoon een spectrum is. Het is een andere manier van omgaan met hetzelfde. Wat hij net aangaf, de narcist, die gaat zeggen... ik ben de perfecte ouder en ik stoot die andere af. En de borderline die gaat veel meer in de paniekaanval. Verlaat mij niet alsjeblieft. Uh, says one subgroup of borderline patients, namely the narcissistic personalities... seem to have a defensive organization similar to borderline conditions... and yet many of them function at a much better psychosocial level. Uh, the defensive organization of these patients, narcissists, is quite similar to that of the borderline personality organization in general. Okay. What distinguishes many of the patients with narcissistic personalities from the usual borderline patient is their relatively good social functioning, their better impulse control, 
and the capacity for active, consistent work in some areas, which permits them to partially fulfill their ambitions of greatness and of obtaining admiration from others. Dat is narcistische supply, dus de narcist, dus dat geeft hij net aan. Die kan op andere terreinen veel beter functioneren en die heeft eigenlijk nodig, die heeft nodig dat andere mensen zeggen, kijk hoe goed je bent. Die hebben constant die validatie nodig. De social media is verschrikkelijk. Want als hun, dat soort mensen is het uh, geweldig. Maar ze hebben de constant die validatie nodig. The under stress, both narcissistic borderline types personalities, can decompensate into uh, delusional belief systems. Theodor Milan, one of the preeminent uh, experts on personality disorders, author of the gold standard for assessing personality disorders, the MCMI, comments or discusses the decompensation of a narcissistic personality under stress into delusional beliefs. Under conditions of unrelieved adversity and failure, narcissists may decompensate into paranoid disorders. Owing to their excessive use of fantasy mechanisms, they are disposed to misinterpret events and to construct delusional beliefs. Unwilling to accept constraints on their independence and unable to accept the viewpoints of others, narcissists may isolate themselves from the corrective effects of shared thinking. Alone, they may ruminate and weave their beliefs into a network of fanciful and totally invalid suspicions. Among narcissists, delusions often take form after a serious challenge or setback has upset their image of superiority and omnipotence. That's the divorce. They tend to exhibit compensatory grandiosity and jealousy delusions in which they reconstruct reality to match the image they are unable or unwilling to give up. Delusional systems may also develop as a result of having felt betrayed and humiliated. Again, the divorce is going to act absolutely trigger that. Here we may see the rapid unfolding of persecutory delusions and an arrogant grand grandiosity characterized by verbal attacks and bombast. I'm going Kijk, dus normaal gesproken ga je uit elkaar, man en vrouw, en dan denk je, weet je, we passen niet bij elkaar, helaas heeft het niet gewerkt. Alleen voor de narcist is het verschrikkelijk, van ik heb gefaald. En die gaat het dus, wat hij net aangeeft, dus afreageren van, oh, die ander heeft mij iets aangedaan. En die zal een soort realiteit construeren die totaal niet klopt met de werkelijkheid. We're going to come back to this again when we talk about the reenactment narrative. And so it's important to recognize that narcissistic borderline personalities decompensate into delusional beliefs. And a lot of people think of the psychotic domain around schizophrenia or something that's very flamboyant. Not necessarily. This would be considered an encapsulated delusion. Um, Aaron Beck and his colleagues um, note that the diagnosis of borderline was introduced in the 1930s to label patients with problems that seemed to fall somewhere between neuroses and psychoses. And so we're dealing with a decompensation into a false belief system that is intransigently held coming out of these internal working models of attachment. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So with the narcissistic dynamic, what we have is we have three sources of excessive anxiety being triggered for the narcissistic parent. The first is that reactivation of the attachment trauma, and I'll deal with that later. But for the personality disorder level, we have the activation of the narcissistic inadequacy fears. The divorce triggers, you are an inadequate spouse, you're an inadequate person, and because of that you're being rejected, which triggers the borderline fears of abandonment. And so the narcissistic borderline parent around the divorce has these two excessive uh, anxieties, uh, sources of anxiety to cope with. And um, the narcissistic parent misinterprets this ex um, excessive anxiety as representing an actual threat posed by the other parent who is the triggering source of the anxiety. And so anxiety signals threat. They have a lot of anxiety. It must be something about you that is threatening. And because of that, the narcissistic personality organization begins to decompensate into persecutory delusional beliefs that the other parent represents a threat to the child. Why a threat to the child? We're going to understand that when we go into the attachment trauma. 
it's going to be funneled through the anxiety is going to be funneled through the attachment patterns into a threat to the child. So the narcissistic borderline parent at the personality disorder level has to cope with these excessive anxieties and they psychologically expel through projective displacement onto the other parent the narcissistic fear of inadequacy and the borderline fear of an abandonment by means of the child's induced symptomatic rejection of the other parent. So that you're the inadequate parent, you know, not me. You're the abandoned parent, not me. You know, the child is rejecting you. The child wants me. I'm the ideal, all wonderful parent who will never be abandoned by the child. And so the whole process of what we call parental alienation, where the parent induces a child's rejection of the other parent, the narcissistic borderline parent is using the child in what's called a role reversal relationship to regulate that parent's own anxieties. It's not me that's inadequate, it's you. It's not me that's abandoned, it's you. I'm the wonderful parent who will never be abandoned. That's eigenlijk altijd de stijl van de narcist die uh, kan zelf zijn eigen emoties niet reguleren. Je zal er altijd anderen voor nodig hebben. Die zal ook uh, denken aan uh, dat je nog in die relatie zat. Chaos veroorzaken. En jij denkt van, maar we willen het oplossen. Maar er komt iedere keer weer chaos. Het komt omdat je steeds weer wordt geconfronteerd met de emotionele disregulatie. Dus het is niet anders dan anders. Wat er nu wel aangeeft is dat het geprojecteerd wordt. Dus dat die uh, ouder echt denkt van, de andere ouder is een gevaar. Ik twijfel daaraan. Ik weet het niet zeker. Ik denk dat de narcist of de borderliner heel goed weet wat die aan het doen is. En dat merk je eraan dat ze zich op een... Als ze in een andere situatie zijn, kunnen ze zich wel goed gedragen. Dus de ene situatie kunnen ze extreem doen alsof de andere ouder een gevaar is. Maar in andere situaties kunnen ze zich compleet normaal gedragen. Dus dat kan alleen als jij in controle bent en weet wat goed of fout is. Dus op uh, YouTube zie je ook een aantal narcisten die aangeven van ja, dat is ook zo. Ik weet heel goed wat ik aan het doen ben. Ik ben nog niet over uit. So the child's induced rejection of the targeted parent is being used by the narcissistic borderline parent to regulate the parent's own excessive anxiety of activated narcissistic inadequacy and the borderline fear of abandonment that was triggered by the rejection of the divorce. That in early childhood, the, what the phrase is, is the child is being used as a regulating other for the parent. Maar dat zie je wel vaker in gezinnen. Uh, dat één persoon, één van de kinderen wordt dan uitgekozen als jij bent het probleem in het gezin. En dus er zijn de, de vader, moeder, andere kinderen. Er kunnen meerdere problemen zijn in een gezin. Maar als de ouders daar niet mee kunnen kopen of één van de ouders niet, dan gaan ze al hun zorgen projecteren op één van de kinderen. Dat wordt dan het zwarte schaap. Of het kind waar altijd iets mee, mis mee is. Altijd ziek of kwaaltjes of iets anders. En zo'n kind neemt onbewust die rol aan. En die kan dan ook psychologische stoornissen gaan ontwikkelen. Extreme angsten, uh, OCD, sp- heel veel spanning aanvaren, depressiviteit. En dan zal de, de ouders al heel liefhebbend zijn van... Oh, en ik wil ervoor zorgen. Maar ondertussen worden al die dysfuncties geprojecteerd op dat ene kind... En die neemt onbewust die rol aan waarom Kim moet overleven. Kim moet zijn ouders bij zich houden. By projectively displacing these inadequacy and abandonment fears onto the other parent through the child's rejection of the parent. So now let's drop the third level down to the foundations, which are the attachment system level. At the level of the attachment system, The attachment system creates internal working models of relationship expectations during childhood. Internal working models are Bowlby's phrase. Uh, Beck uses the word schemas. And so they create these patterns of expectations about self and other in relationship. These internal working models then coalesce as we move into adulthood into what we would call personality factors. And if it's trauma involved, we're going to get some personality disorders. So more and more we're moving towards personality disorders, particularly narcissistic and borderline personality. We're beginning to understand them at the attachment system level rather than the personality disorder level. 
The attachment system and its internal working models of relationship expectations mediate all of our future responses regarding both the formation and the loss of close emotionally bonded relationships throughout the lifespan. So we have these patterns. They go quiet in most of our everyday lives as adults, but whenever we form new relationships, a spousal relationship or any, those, the attachment system will glow warm and our patterns of expectations will begin to mediate the formation of those relationships. Or whenever we lose somebody that's close to us, the attachment system will also start to glow warm and mediate the loss and how we, we deal with the loss of situations. So that the divorce uh, triggered the alienating parents activate our uh, attachment system to mediate that loss experience. The formation of narcissistic and borderline personality disorder processes is the product of attachment drama during childhood. That's just the way it is. We don't get narcissistic and borderline personalities unless we have attachment trauma. That's how it's produced. The internal working models for attachment figures in the alienating parents traumatized attachment networks have three components. There's the uh, victimized child, the abusive parent, and the protective parent. And the, the split between abusive parent and nurturing protective parent is called splitting. And I discussed that more in my previous uh, talk on this. And so in that psychological process of the abusive trauma, the child psychologically splits their representational network for the parent into the abusive parent and the protective parent so that as a way of managing the anxiety around a parent who's both a source of nurture and a source of threat. So in terms of the child's, or in terms of the alienating parents' attachment networks, uh, at the point of divorce, we have the, the co-activation in the brain of two sets of attachment representations. One coming out of the internal working models from childhood that involves victimized child, abusive parent, protective parent, and one in the current relationships, which is the current child, the other parent, and the alienating parent. And notice there's a one-to-one -one correspondence there. And so in the brain, when you have the co-activation of two sets of brain networks, one from the past, one from the current situation, there is a psychological um, fusion of these two brain networks, an equivalency between these two co-activated networks. So that the co-activation within the attachment system of two sets of representational networks, one for the persons in the current family relationships and one set embedded in the internal working models of attachment system, create a psychological fusion or psychological equivalency between the patterns embedded in the internal working models of the, and the current people in the current relationships. And so, these two sets fuse into one. And so we have the victimized current child, the abusive targeted parent, and the protective alienating parent. And so it, within the distorted psychology of the narcissistic borderline mind, this becomes reality. This is the reactivation of their trauma. And this is what they see. And this is the decompensation into that delusional belief system. They lose track of what real people are actually the situation. And they begin to see the world in their trauma networks. And one of the key elements of this is that victimized child uh, scenario. Because that's the alienating parent. As Als het waar zou zijn, wat hij nu zegt, van, uh, dat het oude systeem wordt geactiveerd dan zou die ouder, die verstotende ouder, die zal bijvoorbeeld hulpverlening inzetten. Die zal zeggen van, ja, die andere ouder is gevaarlijk. En nou, wat er gebeurt, dat gebeurt ook wel eens, dat er uh, beschuldigingen worden geuit. Maar vaak zijn het vals beschuldigingen die ook later worden teruggetrokken. Ik hoorde een verhaal van een ouder, die had een, was een moeder. En die had de vader beschuldigd van uh, seksuele mishandeling van het kind. En jaren later was het opeens van, ja, nee, ja, dat kind zei het, maar ik geloof het niet, niet echt. En dat zie je heel vaak, vals beschuldigingen. Uh, je ziet het ook dat de beschuldigingen niet consequent zijn. Dus het ziet er veel meer naar uit dat die verstotende ouder, die wil die andere ouder uit het leven halen, maar die is niet eerlijk tegen hulpverlening. Dus die doet zich ook anders voor. Want anders zou die verstotende ouder zeggen, nou ja, inderdaad, ik vind, ik vind niet dat uh, mijn kinderen mogen bellen met, uh, 
met vader. Of uh, nee, ik vind inderdaad dat ze weg moeten gaan, dat die weg moet blijven uitleven aan mijn kind. Alleen dat gebeurt dus niet. Vaak wordt het gebracht als, ja nee, ik wil echt zorgen dat het uh, goed gaat tussen, tussen uh, ik en mijn partner en het kind. Dus hoe het eruit ziet in de praktijk, lijkt het veel meer doelbewust. En dat ze echt wel weten van, ik ben niet goed bezig. Ik denk niet aan mijn kind. Ik neem wraak op die andere ouder. Want ze zijn gekwetst. As a child. That's the source of their tremendous anxiety. They were the victimized child. And so now this current child is become symbolically their representation of themselves as a child. Which they have to then protect from the abusive parent. And they begin to act out all this... This, um, nonsense. So that rather than responding to the actual people in the current family relationship, the personality disordered alienating parent instead reenacts past childhood trauma attachment through the current relationships, with the victimized child being one of the key components of this. Um, the in terms of representing the importance of this reenactment. The victimized child role is central to, to this whole reenactment trauma because it then defines the other two roles. The moment the child is victimized, that automatically defines the targeted parent as being abusive. And the moment the child accepts the victimized child role, that automatically allows the alienating parent to be the protective parent. And so the critical feature in uh, in this whole dynamic is getting the child to adopt the victimized child uh, role. So let's underst understanding the re Deze is heel belangrijk. Dus het kind wordt wijsgemaakt, jij bent een slachtoffer. Slachtoffer van die andere ouder, die is niet goed voor jou. Jij moet beschermd worden. En dan kan de verstotende ouder, die kan dan de zorgzame ouder zijn. Enactment narrative. The divorce triggers three separate but interrelated sources of tremendous anxiety for the narcissistic board. Ik wil, de, wil ook nog aangeven, hij geeft nu aan de divorce, de scheiding is het trigger. Maar in veel gevallen hoor je ook dat het al veel langer aan de gang is. Want het is niet zo dat de narcistische ouder of de ouder met borderline de rest van de tijd wel normaal was. Die was altijd al uh, niet goed bezig. En ik hoor heel veel verhalen van ouders waarbij al tijdens het huwelijk waren die al bezig om een coalitie aan te gaan met het kind. Dus ik ben heel benieuwd waarom hij nu die trigger aangeeft. Het zal het verergeren. Maar het kan zelfs zijn dat na een scheiding, jaren na een scheiding, dat het opeens wordt ingezet. Borderline parent. The narcissistic anxiety associated with the uh, activation of uh, primal self inadequacy. The borderline anxiety uh, surrounding a tremendous fear of abandonment. And also a trauma anxiety around the internal working models of attachment that are in the pattern of victimized child abusive parent. The narcissistic borderline parent misinterprets the meaning of this anxiety as falsely representing a threat posed by the other parent as a triggering origin for the anxiety. The origins of the delusional processes lay in the misattribution of causality for an authentic experience of immense anxiety. The subsequent activity of the alienating narcissistic borderline parent essentially represents efforts at anxiety management regarding these three tremendous sources of anxiety. And then we see our full display of what's going on in terms of parental alienation. So the intense anxiety of the narcissistic borderline parent is being channeled into and through the reactivated trauma network patterns of the internal working models, the organizing schemas of the attachment system, abusive parent, victimized child, protective parent. And so that's why the child, the other parent represents a risk to the child because it's coming through those, those attachment networks. Now, nou ja, dat niet alleen de andere ouder die, even uitgaande, dat die wel normaal is, dat die geen persoonlijke stoornis heeft is ook een, een threat, omdat bijvoorbeeld de, de narcistische ouder... die zal heel veel last hebben van bijvoorbeeld... die heeft last van emotiedereregulatie, woedeuitbarstingen... die zal heel erg onveilig zijn voor dat kind. En die komt dan opeens terecht bij die andere ouder... die stabiel is. Dus dan wordt het verschil heel erg duidelijk. Dus dat is ook een reden waarom de verstotende ouder... de andere ouder ziet als een bedreiging. Want opeens wordt duidelijk van... wacht eens even. 
het is helemaal niet nodig om zomaar boos te worden. Of het is niet normaal dat je opeens boos bent. Als deze kinderen de schuld geeft, dat is niet normaal. Dus hoe de narcistische ouder is, hoe de borderline ouder is, wordt nu exposed. En ze weten zelf ook dat ze niet goed bezig zijn. Dus dat is de reden waarom ze niet alleen de andere ouder uit het leven van het kind willen halen, halen maar alles en iedereen die dat ook ziet. Dus ook de familie van de andere ouder wordt uit het leven gebannen. Alles wat ingaat, wat in kan gaan tegen het verhaal van de verstotende ouder, die wordt verwijderd. The way the narcissistic borderline parent induces the child's symptoms is complex, is subtle. Uh, there's a lot of ideas within the current uh, issues surrounding parental alienation and high conflict divorce that it has to do with the other parent, the alienated parent bad mouthing the other parent or saying bad things in front of the child. It's not how it happens. It's much subtler. It's much more complex than that. Because if it was just a matter of that, the kid would go, no, I like my mom. I mean, she's fine. It's a much subtler process um, that, that happens. The reenactment there. Nou ja, er wordt, er wordt zeker wel kwaad gesproken. Alleen hij geeft aan van dat is niet, dat is niet alleen. Dus nee, er wordt kwaad gesproken over de andere ouder. Hij geeft nu aan van, dan zou het kind zeggen van ja, nee, nee dat vind ik niet. Hij vergeet dat er ook kinderen zijn van uh, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, waarbij dat ook gebeurt. En die hebben heel die capaciteit niet. Wat ze horen is waarheid. Kinderen leren pas op latere leeftijd kritisch na te denken. Dat gebeurt pas rond... 11, 12, 13, dan pas kom je als kind erachter van, wacht eens even, bij mij was het ongeveer 12 jaar. Maar wat mijn moeder, wat mijn vader doet, is niet oké. Okay. Voor die tijd, kinderen geloven alles. Er zullen vast uitzonderingen zijn, dus voel je niet aangesproken. Narrative of abusive parent, victimized child, protective parent, that essentially represents the symptom features of parental alienation, is created by inducing the child to adopt the victimized child role. That's the critical element. If I can get the child to believe they're a victim, then it automatically defines the other parents as abusive and automatically defines me as the protective parent. So that's the critical feature. The, um, yeah, so the, the key to creating the, um, the reenactment narrative is to induce the child into adopting the victimized child role. Everything else flows from that. So, the way that that's ha induced is you first, the alienated parent will first elicit a criticism from the child. And so the narcissistic borderline parent will elicit the criticism through motivated, over-anxious and directive questioning, such as, how did, things go, how did everything go at your father's house? Did everything go okay? And you get this anx anxious, did everything go okay? Child, let's say, says, yeah, everything was fine. Really? You two got along okay? Nothing happened? And so the parent won't accept that response. They'll keep probing. They'll keep, for, come on, tell me something. Tell me, give me something, give me something. And even if it's very mild, such as, well, it was kind of boring. Okay, how mild the criticism is that? It was kind of boring. The next phase is where the alienating parent distorts that and exaggerates that. Um, so, yeah, it was kind of boring. Oh, I can't believe your father didn't have anything for you planned for you to do. He only has one weekend with you, and he can't come up with anything for you guys to do together. Oh, gosh, he's only thinking of himself. I can't believe that. Okay. So in the response of the narcissistic borderline parent, they exaggerate and distort this and communicate to the child that the, the other parent um, is, is something wrong with the other parent. Um, dus de reactie van de, de ouder is heel belangrijk. Kind komt thuis, heeft een leuke tijd gehad. En die andere ouder gaat alleen maar de nadruk leggen op de negativiteit. En die gaat er al vanuit van nee, het is niet goed gegaan. Dus een kind heeft totaal geen weerstand hier tegen, dus die zal dat geloven. Waarom zou mijn moeder liegen? Dus die neemt dat aan. Of die denkt in het begin misschien van nou, waar, waar heeft ze het over? Maar na een tijdje, als je dat keer op keer hoort... Worden die zaakjes geplant? Misschien ken je dat, die film Inception. Klein zaadje van, wacht even, misschien is het inderdaad iets niet goed. Want waarom zou mijn moeder liegen? Of waarom zou mijn vader liegen? En ook de reactie, de emotionele reactie, die wordt ook opgepikt. Kind zal denken van, waarom reageert mijn moeder zo raar? En die gaat langzaam die emotie overnemen. Als je een kind hebt, kind valt, is één jaar, twee jaar, die rent, die valt. Kind kijkt op, schrikt, kijkt.
kijkt eerst naar jouw reactie als ouder. En als jij als ouder bent van, oh jee, wat erg, oh verschrikkelijk, gaat het kind huilen. Als je zegt, kom op, sta op, niks aan de hand. Even vanuit gaan dat het niet al te erg is. Het kind staat op, niks aan de hand. Het kind leeft door jouw emotie. Dus ouders, ouders zijn heel belangrijk. Dus het kind gaat keer, dus dit gebeurt keer op keer op keer op keer. Het kind gaat die emotie overnemen van de verstotende ouder. Ook trouwens van, de, van de, de ouder die niet aan het verstoten is. Alleen, angst en pijn, daar wordt veel, dat blijft heel erg hangen. Als iets heel erg is, dat blijft veel meer hangen. Dus als je alleen maar positief bent naar een kind, dat is niet gevaarlijk. Dus het kind zal extra waakzaam zijn voor gevaarlijke situaties. Ja. Yeah. In addition, um, the, it's supposedly it's the child who is offering the criticism. The narcissistic borderline parent is simply sort of supposedly being a supportive parent to the, the child, which allows the narcissistic borderline parent to adopt that coveted role as the all wonderful, protective, supportive parent. Um, and this presentation that offered to the child, I'm your supportive parent, I'm the one who cares about you, is in direct contrast to the presentation of the other parent that they're abusively inadequate, they're not caring enough for you. Ja, dus een van de tactieken van de narcist of de borderliner is, uh, die wil zichzelf groter voelen. Of die heeft zelf wel het idee, ik ben grandiose. Die doet dat door anderen naar beneden te halen. Dus ook het kind moet naar beneden worden gehaald. Het kind is, heeft zorg nodig. Het gaat niet goed met het kind. Het kind is slachtoffer. Dus de grootste tactiek, hè, want ze, ze zijn leeg van binnen. Ze kunnen zichzelf niet omhoog brengen. In veel gevallen. Sommige narcisten wel. Die gaan de politiek in of die hebben grote bedrijven. Maar ze willen anderen juist om me laag brengen. The um, narcissistic borderline parent can acquires the proper answers from the child through subtle communication cues, such as the loss of emotional tone if the child doesn't give the right answer. So how was everything at your mom's house? It was good. Oh, okay. And just that drop in emotional tone signals, that's the wrong answer. Or, because we're dealing with narcissistic borderline, they may get a little angry at the child. So how is everything over there? Fine. Really? Okay, you need to clean your room. You need to, you need to do this. And all of a sudden they get a little hostility and angry because they gave the wrong answer. And through that process, it's very easy to communicate to the child what's the right answer to give mom, what's the wrong answer to give mom, what's the right answer to give dad, what's the wrong answer to give dad. So the child begins to pay attention to what the parent wants because it can be dangerous living with a narcissistic borderline personality. The narcissistic rage and the borderline angry is very sharp and very intense. And then on the reverse side, the emotionally animated responses of the parent signal you gave me the right answer. Okay, so when the parent, child says, oh, it was, you know, they got mad at me for not cleaning the dishwasher. It's like, oh my goodness, oh. And the child recognizes that the parent loves that. That's a good answer, because now the parent gets all upset and, oh, how terrible things are. But to all external appearances, supposedly, the narcissistic borderline parent is simply being supportive of the child. They're not bad-mouthing the other parent. They're simply being an understanding and wonderful parent. And that's the communication to the child as well. And so if therapists or attorneys or the judge ask the child, is your you know, parent bad-mouthing? No, I'm the one doing the bad-mouthing. They're not doing it. It's me, which is a source of that independent thinker kind of thing regarding the child. The child is led into a belief that they are a victim and that they're the ones that are making the criticism. In addition, the narcissistic borderline parent conveys meaning to the child um, that the, the other parenting, the par parenting practices of the other parent are abusively inadequate to the child. And so the parental outrage of, oh, they're treating you so terrible, communicates to the child that they are the victim. And it's this process of inducing this belief in the victimization of the child in which the narcissistic personality processes of the, sort of this grandiose entitlement are transferred to the child. And so later we will see that narcissistic grandiosity of judging the other parent and from an uh, up-top-down position, 
and this sense of entitlement that the targeted parent has to meet my needs to my satisfaction or else I get to judge them. Well, all of that's being communicated through this, the attitudes of the narcissistic borderline parent as they um, convey that to the child. And then finally, the final component of, of conveying meaning is that the narcissistic borderline pro uh, personality conveys the appropriate themes for criticizing the other parent. So you have, oh, I can't believe your father you know, didn't have anything for you to do. He only has the one weekend. You should, you know, you'd think he could you know, come, arrange to have something to do, so there's your sense of entitlement. He's just so selfish. He only thinks about what he wants. So the, they slip in that criticism. Oh, she has anger management problems. She was always this way. And there's your theme. And so as the child is getting this influence that they want, they're supposed to criticize the other parent along these themes. And pretty soon the child comes home from visitations. The parent says, how are things? The child feeds right the theme, right the stuff. And it just feeds that whole um, reenactment uh, narrative. So that um, the alienating parent, the narcissistic borderline parent, since the child is fulfilling their role as a victimized child, the alienating parent can then adopt the role of the supportive, nurturing parent. Oh, I so care about you. Oh, it's so terrible that you have to put up with that. Oh, and, and then they display that to all the therapists, to all the attorneys, this coveted role as the all wonderful, perfectly uh, nurturing parent. Um, so through the continual repetitions of this motivated and directed questioning process, the child is induced into adopting the victimized child role. Uh, the moment the child adopts this victimized child role in the reenactment narrative, this immediately and automatically defines the targeted parent into the abusive parent role. And so all the therapists, when the child presents and says, I'm a victimized child, all the therapists believe that and go, well, you must be an abusive parent then. And immediately the focus is taken off of the narcissistic borderline parent and the disordered parenting practices of this parent and their inadequacy and all this stuff, and it's put on the, the other parent. You're a bad parent. Now, the other parent has to prove a negative. They have to prove, I'm not an abusive parent, I'm actually a good parent. And so everybody's focused and, and they have to, and it keeps the focus off the pathology of the narcissistic parent, which is what it's designed to do. The narcissistic parent puts the child out front in a role reversal relationship and then hides behind the child and presents as the nurturing parent, which is the role they want as the all wonderful narcissist. And that's where the victimized child role allows that narcissistic parent to adopt that protective parent role. The ik zag voor het eerst volgens mij in uh, The Sixth Sense, Bruce Willis, 1999. Uh, dat hij, er kwam dus ook een ouder in voor. En die vergiftigde, die moeder, vergiftigde haar eigen dochter. En, maar met een heel klein beetje vergif, waardoor die, dat kind altijd ziek was. En niemand wist waarom. Die, dat kind is uiteindelijk overleden. Spoiler alert. Maar dit geeft aan dat de moeder, ook in dat geval, die nam dus die rol aan van de verzorgende moeder. En wat, wat krijg je dan als verzorgende moeder? Iedereen om je heen gaat zeggen van, oh, wat erg voor je. Oh, ja, wat goed dat je dat allemaal kan. En ik snap dat het erg voor je is. Validatie ten koste van het kind. Doelbewust in dat geval. Die moeder wist, ze gaf gif aan het kind. En nu zie je dat ook bij narcistische ouders. Dat ze heel goed weten van, ik weet dat ik niet aan het kind denk. En dat zullen ze misschien ook wel eens zeggen. Hij geeft hier aan van dat het allemaal onbewust is. Maar uh, ga maar eens na. Wat, wat zie jij als je dit hebt meegemaakt? Als ouder of als kind? Wat kan je nog herinneren van de doelbewustheid hiervan? Attachment system. In the suppression of the child's attachment system. The attachment system evolved across millions of years of evolution. Involving the selective predation of children. Predators are seeking the old, the weak and the young. Children who bonded to parents got protection from Predators, children who didn't, were eaten by predators. It's a very strong and resilient system. We all live in an attachment system. We all know what it's like to love our parents, even though they were kind of messed up, even though there were problems. We still love them. We still love our children, even though they're annoying at times. Because of the strength of that attachment system, we understand how strong it is. But in this situation, we have a child rejecting a relationship with a normal range and affectionately available parent. How do we get that? 
How do we suppress the attachment system of a child? Well, this is how it occurs. By inducing the child into adopting the victimized child role, the other parent, the targeted parent, is immediately and automatically defined as the abusive parent. And by defining the other parent as a threat to the child, as abusively inadequate parent, this automatically suppresses the child's attachment bonding motivations towards this supposedly abusive parent. Because children are not motivated to bond to the threat, to the predator. They're mo instead, children are motivated to flee from the threat and to bond to the protective parent. So the moment the child is induced into this belief that they're a victim, then the attachment system is shut off towards that predator and they are motivated to bond to the supposedly protective parent, which is the, the role of the narcissistic borderline parent. Dus dan zie je ook dat het eigenlijk zware, zware psychologische mishandeling is. Het kind moet gewoon een van de ouders afwijzen en daarmee ook een gedeelte van zichzelf. Kan bij de andere ouder, bij de verstotende ouder niet zichzelf zijn. Moet een rol innemen van slachtoffer. En het hele leven van het kind is er om die ouder ten, ja, ten dienst te staan. En dat klopt ook, hè? De narcist en de borderliner, ik noem ze cluster B, die ziet het kind ook niet als een ander iemand. Het is een extensie van zichzelf. Dus het kind zien ze alleen maar als een entiteit die er is voor hun, voor hen. Om hen te pleasen. Dus ook al heeft het kind die andere ouder verstoten... De mishandeling gaat door in het huis. Dat stopt niet zomaar. And these are exactly the symptoms of parental alienation. Right there. The child is fleeing from the threat and they will say, oh, they're horrible to me. They're a really bad parent. And they are hyperbonded to the narcissistic borderline parent. They don't separate. Now, if you know anything about the attachment system, a secure attachment, the child ventures out into the world and then comes back. A child who is preoccupied on maintaining a relationship with a parent, that's called an insecure attachment. Insecure, preoccupied, or anxious, ambivalent because of a variably available parent. But that's what we see with parental alienation. The child's hyperbonding motivation towards a narcissistic borderline parent isn't a symptom of healthy bonding. It's a symptom of pathological bonding. It's an insecure attachment. The child's not going out and forming new relationships with the other parent. Instead, the child's hyper-focused on the alienating parent. Ja, en verder, het kind zal super onzeker zijn. Die zal niet, die zal niet um, in de buitenwereld zelf keuze durven te maken. Die zal constant naar die ouder toe gaan van wat moet ik doen, wat moet ik doen? Yep. So the child seeks to flee from the supposed threat posed by the abusive targeted parent and the child seeks the continual protective proximity of the supposedly protective parent which is the role being prominently displayed and adopted by the narcissistic borderline parent. But none of this narrative is true. The child is not a victim. The parenting practices of the targeted rejected parent are not abusive. And the narcissistic borderline parent is not the ideal, wonderful, all nurturing parent. It is a false narrative created by a narcissistic borderline parent as an outward recreation of this parent's own attachment trauma history. At its core, the varied processes of what we would traditionally describe as parental alienation represent an outward manifestation of psychotic delusional processes of a narcissistic borderline parent arising from the distorted internal working models of attachment in which past childhood trauma is being recreated and reenacted in current relationships. This is very serious psychopathology. Not only is it personality disordered psychopathology, the reenactment out of childhood of these trauma shifts it over into a delusional psychotic process within the family. And now I will remind you of what Theodore Milan said about the decompensation of a narcissistic personality into delusional beliefs, into persecutory delusional beliefs. That's exactly what's going on, is we have this psychotic process within this family. And what astounds me is that mental health therapists are entirely missing the 
extent of the psychopathology within this family. Holy cow, this is really serious. And they just think it's normal range kind of parent-child stuff and, and they don't recognize it, they don't see it. So the schematic diagrams for describing this process. First you have the three levels at the attachment system level, personality disorder level, the family systems level. Um, and then this particular schematic shows the, how the disorganized preoccupied attachment of the alienating parent moves into both attachment trauma and the personality disorder processes that are then reactivated in the divorce as a borderline fear of abandonment and the narcissistic inadequacy. The borderline fear of abandonment leads to what's called an invalidating environment discussed by Marshall Linehan and the narcissist decompensates into persecutory delusions that are also being fed by the attachment trauma that then create the suppression of the child's attachment system and the uh, projection of the narcissistic inadequacy and borderline abandonment fears onto the other parent. Complicated, complex, because the inner world of a narcissistic borderline parent is a complicated, complex place you know, with trauma histories and all this kind of stuff. But while it may seem complicated on first blush, it stays the same. This will be the same tomorrow as it was yesterday. It'll be the same next week, six months from now. This is, is very structured. It's very continual. This is what... Als je ervaring mee hebt, dan weet je van... Ik heb het inderdaad heel complex. En, uh, kijk je op YouTube of Spotify met video, dan zie je een heel schema. Hij geeft aan een complexe innerlijke wereld. Ja en nee. Want ze doen eigenlijk bijna allemaal exact hetzelfde. Het lijkt alsof narcisten en borderliners... Alsof ze daar een grote convention zijn geweest en ze hebben exact dezelfde regels meegekregen over hoe moeten ze reageren. Dus ze doen keer op keer exact hetzelfde. Het gedrag is, als je eenmaal weet dat je te maken hebt met een narcist of met een borderliner, compleet voorspelbaar. En ze kunnen niet anders dan doen zoals ze zijn geprogrammeerd. Het was denk aan, uh, je bent vast wel in de Efteling geweest, dan heb je van die wagentjes... Die zit op zijn spoor en jij denkt van, ik ga naar links en rechts. Nee, ze, ze gaan het pad. Ze volgen één een, een pad. Zelfde met narcisten en borderliners. Ze kunnen niet anders. Dus ze zijn gigantisch voorspelbaar. What it is, it will always stay this way. So as you become more and more familiar with it, you go, okay, I get it. The clarity begins to move through because it's not something that's highly variable or changing all the time. So now, understanding what is going on, then allows us to identify where should we look to diagnosis. What features stand out in this that we can diagnose this reliably and in every case? So there's a set of three diagnostic indicators by which we can reliably diagnose this every time it occurs and differentially diagnose it when it's not occurring. The presence in the child's symptom display. So I'm not worried about how these two are interacting. I don't need to diagnose a narcissistic personality. That, that's going down a rabbit hole if I try to diagnose a parent. I'm looking at the child's symptom display because I'm looking at the influence of that on the... Het is ook heel lastig om een ouder die, die dus niet wil dat een diagnose wordt gesteld, om daar een diagnose voor te maken. Dus dat geeft wel aan, ik heb daar geen zin in. Uh, weet je nog, een tijdje geleden, was vorig jaar met Amber Heard en Johnny Depp. Dat was publiek en het was heel mooi om te zien dat Amber Heard is een duidelijke narcist. En daar was dus ook een, een dokter en die heeft, daar, heeft dus ook een diagnose gedaan. Maar een hele uitgebreide diagnose waarbij dus ook gecontroleerd werd voor valse antwoorden. Omdat ze dan weten van als iemand probeert om die test te omzeilen, dan gaan ze bepaalde antwoorden geven. En die had er ook rekening mee gehouden. Alleen wie doet dat in Nederland? Of in Amerika standaard? Het is heel uitgebreid wordt niet zomaar gedaan. The child. So the presence in the child symptom display of three specific diagnostic indicators represents definitive clinical evidence for the presence of pathogenic parenting. Now, the word parental alienation is not a clinical term. As a clinical psychologist, I don't know what that means. The correct clinical term is pathogenic parenting. Patho is pathology 
genic genesis, the creation. It's parenting practices that are creating a pathology in the child. The word pathogenic parenting is used a lot in attachment work because that's what messes up the kid's attachment system is pathogenic parenting. And so that's the correct clinical term. So the three diagnostic indicators are definitive clinical evidence of pathogenic parenting practices by the allied and supposedly favored parent that are directly responsible for the child's symptomatic cutoff of a relationship with the other parent. Cutoff is a term out of uh, Bowen family systems work. Notice that definition there never uses the word parental alienation. We don't need it. Okay? We can define this entirely within standard psychological constructs. The three diagnostic indicators are the attachment system suppression, which you don't see. That's, that's an aberrant display of the child's attachment system. You will also see a set of personality disorder symptoms in the child's symptom display that are being acquired from the influence of the narcissistic personality. And then you will see this delusional belief that the child is a victim that represents the trauma reenactment. So, criterion one, the uh, attachment system suppression. The child's symptom display evidences a selective and targeted suppression of the normal range functioning of the child's attachment bonding motivations toward one parent in which the child seeks to entirely cut off a relationship with this parent. That doesn't happen. Children who cut off a relationship with a parent were eaten by predators. The attachment system motivates children's bonding to parents even bad parents. In fact, especially bad parents. Because if I have a bad parent, that puts me at risk of predation, so I develop an insecure attachment where I'm more strongly motivated to bond to the bad parent. Cutting off the relationship. Kijk, en wat hij nu aangeeft is, juist als er een slechte ouder zal zijn, zo in de natuur, zo zijn uh, door de evolutie, kind zal geen afstand daarvan nemen. Dus het is ook een van die kenmerken van ouderverstoting, parental alienation. Hij geeft dus aan dat het kind zal juist binden aan de onveilige ouder. En dat gebeurt dus ook met de narcistische ouder. Dus klopt exact. Is indicative that there's a narcissistic parent somewhere. It's either that parent, you're a narcissist, and so you know, you're abusive to me, or sexual predation, or, or physical violence, or something. And so now you, it's authentic. Or if you're not the problematic parent, it's the other one that's narcissist. One way or the other, that's how we see um, cutoffs in relationships. The additional criteria is that we have the absence of severely dysfunctional parenting by the targeted rejected parent. A clinical assessment of the parenting behavior of the rejected parent provides no evidence for severely dysfunctional parenting, such as chronic parental substance abuse, parental violence, or parental sexual abuse of the child that would account for the child's complete rejection of a parent. So if I got a child rejecting parent, I'm going to look at the parent and say, are you physically abusive? Or was there a history of domestic violence? Is there you know, methamphetamine addict? Is there something that would account for that level of distortion to the child's attachment system? In the absence of that, if you're roughly normal range, well then... Ja, oké, okay. geef nu aan, ik ga het aan de vader vragen of aan de moeder vragen die verstoten wordt van uh, is er ernstig uh, geweld, is er drugs aan de hand? Kijk, die gaat natuurlijk waarschijnlijk ook geen antwoord geven. Maar een belangrijk kenmerk is, als je dit aan het kind vraagt wat de ouder verstoot, dan zal die ook geen goed antwoord kunnen geven. Die zal twee of drie dingen kunnen zeggen, maar die, die niet zo heel erg zijn. Ja, ik krijg altijd straf. Die zal het niet kunnen benoemen, omdat het in de emotie zit. Het kind heeft de slachtofferrol aangenomen onbewust en het bewuste, frontale kwap, cortex, gaat een verhaal verzinnen. Waarom heb ik die andere ouder afgestoten? En die komt met een heel raar verhaal. Dat doesn't niet account for. The third element is that roughly normal range. That the parenting practices of the target rejected parent are assessed to be broadly normal range. With due consideration given to the broad spectrum of acceptable parenting practices typically displayed in normal range families. We need to get away from micro-analyzing parenting of the targeted rejected parent. Um, and so it's respect for the bro what represents broadly normal range practices and to the legitimate exercise of parental authority and parental prerogatives in establishing family values and the exercise of normal range parental authority, leadership, and discipline within the parent-child relationship. And 
the one of the ways I conceptualize this is if you put parenting practices on a scale from zero to 100, with zero into the spectrum being lax and permissive parenting and the higher end being firm and structured parenting, normal range parenting practices would somewhere be between like 20 and 80 is normal range. The abnormal range is like 0 to 20 and 80 to 100. Now, as mental health people, we like balanced parenting. We like parents to use some degree of dialogue on the permissive side of things, but also to be firm and structured and provide guidance to the child. So we think the best parenting practices are sort of in the middle and combine a blend of those two qualities. Listening to the child is also providing structure. So we like parenting between the 40 to 60 range. Okay, that combines some sort of blend. But that doesn't mean that the 20 to 40 and you know, 60 to 80 are not normal range. The more you start to move towards those extremes, you're going to get more problems. But we shouldn't be microanalyzing and telling parents that what they should do. Some parents like firm structure. That's their prerogative in establishing family values. Some parents like a little bit more lax and permit. That's their right in establishing their family values according to their cultural belief systems, according to who they are. We shouldn't get it. If the parenting practices are broadly normal range, then we should see an attachment system bond. It's only those very extreme ones that we're concerned about. Heel belangrijk dus. Alleen als een ouder extreem slecht functioneert als ouder, dan pas zou je zien dat een kind afstand gaat nemen. Maar wat hij ook aangaf tussen de 20 en de 80 procent, als ouder kan je verschillende stijlen hebben. Je hoeft niet overeen te komen met wat jeugdhulpverlening bijvoorbeeld vindt. Dat scheelt per ouder. Alleen, wat hij aangeeft, jeugdzorg gaat om micromanagen. Van, oh, misschien moet je iets strenger zijn of misschien iets minder streng. Maar hij geeft aan van, nee, je kijkt dan verkeerd. Dat kind zal geen afstand nemen in dat geval. Alleen in extreme gevallen. De... Second set of symptoms uh, or sy symptomatic diagnostic indicator are narcissistic personality symptoms um, in the child symptom display. The child symptom display toward the targeted rejected parent will evidence a specific set of five narcissistic and borderline personality disorder symptoms that are diagnostically indicative of parental influence on the child of a narcissistic borderline personality. So five a priori predicted symptoms. Those symptoms are the uh, grandiosity, that the child will display a grandiosity where they're elevated in the family hierarchy above the targeted parent to where the child feels entitled to judge that parent and judge that parent as both a parent and as a person. There's an absence of empathy. The child will say and do very cruel things to the targeted rejected parent without any sense of caring or compassion or empathy for the parent. A sense of entitlement that the child expects the targeted parent to meet their every need to the child's satisfaction or else the child feels entitled to exact or retaliatory revenge upon the parent. The child will display a haughty and arrogant attitude towards the parent of contemptuous disdain for who that parent is as a person, and then the splitting. The child will see the targeted parent as the all bad parent and the um, narcissistic parent as the all wonderful parent. And so these are what I, would, I refer to as the psychological fingerprints of control on the child by a narcissistic borderline parent. The only way the child acquires narcissistic personality disorder symptoms is from the influence of a narcissistic parent. They do not arise endogenously to a child. Je zou denken, dit is een makkelijke checklist. Heel duidelijk, objectief vast te stellen. En toch wordt het niet gebruikt. Never occur. And a lot of therapists who don't get it, who don't understand this, look at this set of symptoms and think they're oppositional defiant symptoms or uh, normal range kind of conflict stuff. They're, they're not aware of personality disorder dynamics. One of the key areas that should provoke a look at this is the child's absence of empathy. That's a very unique symptom. You don't see absence of empathy except in autism, narcissistic personality, or antisocial personality. Any other kids, I deal with angry, grumpy kids all the time, ADHD, oppositional defiant, throwing chairs through walls, big argument. The child still has empathy once they calm down Ew. from their anger. Yeah. This kid, no, no empathy. 
no compassion for the targeted parent. And the splitting dynamic. All good, all bad. Things once defined don't change. Okay, that splitting should trigger any mental health professional to begin to look for a narcissistic borderline personality. En waar gaat het dus mis? Wat heb je in jeugdzorg? Heb je daar psychiaters werken? Nauwelijks. Dus die zijn totaal niet opgeleid hiervoor. Now there is an anxiety variant of this, where especially occurs in younger children, typically children around, you know, four, five, six years old, where the child displays an excessive anxiety towards the target of rejected parent. So it's not this grandiose judgment of them. They're terrified of being with that parent. And the source of that is because a narcissistic alienating parent is communicating the other parents a threat to you. And so the little four-year-old goes, oh, really? They're that bad a threat to me? And so they're terrified. The recognizing this particular symptom is as you go down the child's anxiety, it will meet DSM criteria, DSM-5 criteria for a phobic anxiety. So you just walk it down, you look at it and you say, I have a child with a phobia, but the type of phobia will be this bizarre and unrealistic mother type or father type. of. The child has a phobia towards their father. That's just weird. That just doesn't happen. The attachment system would prevent that from happening. You don't have a phobia towards your parent um, because predators going to eat you. You're going to fall off a cliff, but bad things are going to happen. And so it, it is an an induced phobia coming from the emotional signaling of the um, narcissistic borderline parent. The third symptom or, uh, criteria, the diagnostic criteria, is the existence of a persecutory delusional belief. The child symptoms will display an intransigently held fixed and false belief, i.e. a delusion, call it an encapsulated delusion, regarding the fundamental parental inadequacy of the targeted rejected parent in which the child characterizes a relationship with the targeted rejected parent as being emotionally or psychologically abusive of the child. The child may use this fixed and false belief regarding the supposedly in abusive inadequacy of the targeted parent to then justify the child's rejection of the targeted parent, that the targeted parent deserves to be rejected because of the supposedly abusive parenting practices of this parent. Very characteristic. If you hear that theme coming forward, that the parent deserves to be rejected, deserves to be punished, think, think attachment-based parental alienation. It is almost so characteristic that it becomes a diagnostic sign. I didn't include it as part of it because uh, you may not always display, but boy, that attitude is just prevalent. The parent deserves it. Now, let me make a comment at this point, which is that the actual underlying psychotic process supporting the delusional belief system is the reenactment narrative originating in the tra traumatized attachment networks of the narcissistic borderline parent's attachment system, in which there's a psychological equivalency of the past internal working models of attachment and the current family relationships so that the narcissistic borderline parent is reenacting past trauma in current relationships by inducing the child into adopting the victimized child role. That's the psychotic process. That's the source of the delusion. That's the iceberg. What we see on the surface is the child has acquired that belief system and that the abusive inadequacy. But if, you, if you're diagnosing this, you can look for the actual psychotic process in the family. Look for that reenactment narrative and all the themes of that reenactment narrative. Ja, en dat uh, nadoen van het herhalen komt ook van transactionele analyse. En waar ga je dit bij jezelf merken als jij zo'n ouder bent die dus nu uh, verstoten bent of in het proces bent om verstoten te worden? Hoe zijn je andere relaties? Merk je dat je steeds weer in contact komt met mensen, met partners die borderline of narcisme hebben? Dat betekent dat je zelf ook je eigen patroon uit je jeugd aan het nadoen bent. En dit gebeurt op veel meer aspecten. Dus niet alleen met relaties, ook in je werk. Maar het gaat iets dieper van deze podcast, maar het gaat er dus om. Je zit een soort vast in een herhaling van. En je komt er pas uit als je echt aan jezelf gaat werken. Om de trauma te verwijderen, want anders breng je het door naar de volgende generatie. En dan heb je de cherry op de top van de kids. 
um, actual belief system. So the presence of all three of the, in the of symptoms in the child's symptom display represent definitive diagnostic evidence for the presence of pathogenic parenting emanating from the allied and supposedly favored parent as being the direct causal agent for the cutoff of the child's attachment bonding motivations towards the other parent. There is no other explanation possible for the presence in the child's symptom display of all three of these symptoms together other than pathogenic parenting associated with an attachment-based model of parental alienation. If you see this, it's the only way you get to these symptoms. So it's a very clear dichotomous diagnosis. You see this set, that's what we're looking at. Um, if, it's, if you don't see this set, then something else is going on. Uh, the DSM-5 diagnosis. If we see this set of symptoms in the child's symptom display, the appropriate DSM diagnosis, and I have a, an essay article on my website that goes into this in more detail, it's essentially an adjustment disorder with mixed disturbance of emotions and conduct. This requires a stressor. The stressor is not the divorce. The stressor is living with a narcissistic borderline parent. It's a chronic stressor of living with a narcissistic borderline parent that's a producing an adjustment disorder to adjusting to the family's transition. Um, then we have some V codes, a parent-child relationship problem with both parents, a uh, child affected by relationships distress, and sci child psychological abuse confirmed. And let me talk about that for a second. The process of parental alienation represents pathogenic parenting by a narcissistic borderline parent that in, is inducing significant developmental pathology, the suppression of the attachment system, personality pathology, narcissistic and borderline personality traits in the child, and psychiatric pathology, a delusional belief in the child that's resulting in their loss of a, a relationship with the parent. Kortom, als jij denkt, ik kan mijn kinderen niet meer zien, ze hebben afscheid van mij genomen, ze zitten nu bij die andere ouder, weet dus, ze worden op dit moment mishandeld en daardoor krijgen ze trekjes van narcisme en borderline. Dus jij als ouder die niet bent verstoten, jij moet ervoor zorgen, jij bent verantwoordelijk dat jouw kind later, als hij weer bij je terugkomt, of je, het lukt jou om je kind weer eerder te zien, om die hiervan te laten herstellen. Want op dit moment dus, je kinderen worden mishandeld. Um, in the loss of an affectionately bonded relationship with a normal range and affectionately available parent, that when you have parenting practices that are inducing that degree of pathology in the child, that attachment-based parental alienation ceases to be a child custody issue and becomes a child protection issue. That we have personality disorder symptoms beginning to emerge in the child, a delusional belief system where they're losing a relationship with a normal range and affectionately available parent, and the suppression of their attachment system that's going to mess up not only their life, but potentially the lives of their children and their spouse, and the, the attachment system is going to mess up a number of different relationships in their life. That's a child protection issue. So moving to therapy. That Therapy requires that we know what we're treating. And that's one of the major problems out there right now, is people don't know what they're treating with this. They don't know it's a psychotic disorder. They don't know that it's a personality process or that it's a transgenerational transmission of attachment trauma. That children and families evidencing the diagnostic indicators of attachment-based parental alienation represent a special population requiring specialized professional knowledge, training, and expertise to competently diagnose and treat. That mental health therapists and evaluators working with this special population of children and families should possess a professional level of competence in the following areas. The attachment system, its characteristic patterns of functioning and dysfunctioning, personality disorder dynamics, with a particular focus on narcissistic and borderline personality processes, Delusional belief systems, particularly surrounding narcissistic and borderline personality disorder processes and trauma reenactment, and family systems theory focused on recognizing cross-generational parent-child coalitions. So let me take that a little bit deeper. With the attachment theory, 
To be professionally competent working with this special population, the therapists and child custody evaluators, anybody working with this group of kids and families, should have professionally competent, uh, uh, the, the professionally competent assessment and treatment um, to the child's attachment system requires a, a knowledge of the developmental origins of the attachment system, the interpersonal and psychological functions served by the attachment system across the lifespan. People tend to think of attachments only relevant to childhood. No, it's not. It, it mediates relationships across the lifespan. Characteristic features of the attachment system and the characteristic patterns of dysfunctioning so that the child's bonding to the supposedly favored parent is not a sign of secure attachment. That's actually a sign of insecure attachment. We need to understand these, these sort of things if you're going to work with the attachment system. And the attachment system expression in parent-child relationships, particularly with regard to the neurodevelopmental role of protest behavior. Protest behavior is designed to elicit greater parental involvement. And there's reasons for that. The child acting up is designed to elicit parental involvement. Here we have a child acting out to detach, to sever parental involvement. That's not normal. That's not how the brain works. With regard to personality disorder dynamics, professional familiarity with the clinical display of narcissistic and personality um, dynamics, such as you know, Beck and his colleagues, uh, Kernberg, Linehan, Milan, including the expression of these personality dynamics in family relationships and the features of co-narcissistic behavioral displays in children. Rappaport has an article about that, the co-narcissist and what that child looks like. The decompensation of narcissistic and borderline personality dynamics into delusional belief systems under stress and the invalidating environment that's discussed by Linehan relative to the borderline process. Um, at the delusional level, competent professional practice with this special population requires a professional understanding for the formation of delusional belief systems, particularly those associated with the psychological decompensation of narcissistic and borderline personality organization, and including the interpersonal relationship and communication processes by which these false beliefs can be transmitted to a child within a parent-child relationship. Things like parent-child enmeshment, uh, parental emotional signaling, selective and differential parental attunement and misattunement to the children's behavior and to their inner experience, um, as well as children's predisposition to socially reference parents for meaning, particularly in ambivalent situations or in situations where there's parents signaling there's a threat or a danger. So understanding child development and how the ch children work and that parent-child uh, relationship works is critical. Now, on this uh, issue of attunement and misattunement, let me just hij heeft net een hele lange lijst opgenoemd met waar moeten we de hulpverlener aan voldoen. Dus als jij te maken hebt gehad met hulpverlening en die is niet eens in de buurt van de eisen die jij hier neerlegt, dan snap je waarom het misgaat. Want die gaan ervan uit, allebei de ouders hebben het beste voor, voor het kind. En ze hebben geen enkel idee van hoe werkt borderline, hoe werkt um, die enmeshment. Zij zien dan een ouder met een kind en die zijn heel erg close. Dus die missen alle signalen die hij nu net opnoemt. Dus een hele nieuwe, nieuwe tak van sport. Explain those words for a second. It comes out of early childhood stuff. If a child is hungry and the parent feeds the child, that's an attuned response. If the child has a messy diaper and the parent comes changes the diaper, that's an attuned response. If the child is hungry and the parent changes the diaper, that's a misattuned response. If the child has a messy diaper and the parent feeds the child, that's a misattuned response. So it's not a behavior per se, it's how synchronous and aligned that parental behavior is with the child's experience. And so it's like if you think of waveforms. If the parents is attuned to the child, that amplifies the wave because they're troughing and peaking on the same rhythm. If the child and parent are misattuned, that dampens the child's inner experience because the parent's peaking and the child's troughing or the child's peaking and the parents. And so the child's misattuned responses suppress the child's inner experience. Attuned responses amplify it. And so that's how the alienating parent, when the child says, you know, how, did, how was the time with your dad? And the kid says, oh, great, wonderful. And the parent goes, oh and gets all dejected, that's a misattuned response to the child's happiness, which will then suppress the child's experience of happiness. 
when the child says, oh, it's kind of boring, and they go, really, it was so boring? That's a, a tuned response to the child's criticism, which will amplify the child's criticism. And so that's how this process is transmitted. It's not through just overtly bad-mouthing the other parent. And if you're going to work with this special population, you have to understand how this stuff works. Um, family systems theory, that professionally competent assessment and treatment of this special population, population requires a knowledge of family systems theory because you're dealing with family systems. And so uh, structural and strategic family systems are highly recommended and particularly focused on this issue of the cross-generational coalition, the child's triangulation and cross-generational coalition. Failure to possess the specialized professional knowledge, training, and expertise to appropriately diagnose and treat the special population of children and families, um, family processes, represents bound practice beyond the boundaries of professional competence in possible violation of professional practice standards. Ethical standards for psychologists, bound standard 2.02, Psychologists provide services, teach, and conduct research with populations and in areas only within their boundaries of competence based on their education, training, supervised experience, consultation, study, and professional experience. Humanistic child therapy that focuses on validating the child's feelings is absolutely the wrong thing to do. The family processes of parental alienation represent a shared delusional belief in which the child is being induced into adopting and accepting the false role as a victim within the trauma reenactment narrative of the narcissistic borderline parent. Validating a patient's delusional beliefs as a result of professional ignorance regarding the necessary areas of professional expertise required for treatment is colluding with the pathology and represents incompetent therapy. Professionally incompetent... What gebeurt er nu? Kind mag praten bijvoorbeeld met de rechter of met de Raad van de Kinderbescherming. En stellen gewoon een aantal vragen. En wat het kind zegt, is waarheid. Dus er zit totaal niet iets in van, ik moet doorvragen... of ik moet bewust zijn van al deze symptomen. Nee, wat het kind zegt, dat geloven wij. Therapy, as a product of professional ignorance... and from practice beyond the boundaries of professional competence... in violation of professional practice standards... that results in harm to the client, the unresolved developmental personality and psychiatric pathology and the loss for the child of a relationship with a normal range and affectionately available parent would likely represent irresponsible and negligent practice that could expose the therapist to a malpractice lawsuit from the targeted parent. You're not allowed to treat stuff that you don't know what you're doing. Uh, if a patient has cancer and a podiatrist diagnoses and begins treating the cancer with blood pressure medication and the patient dies, that would be considered malpractice. We need to begin to develop professional competence in treating this domain of parent and family issues. Therapy requires knowing what we're treating. Children and families evidencing the clinical and diagnostic indicators of attachment-based parental alienation represent a special population requiring specialized professional knowledge and expertise to competently diagnose and treat. So let's talk about therapy from an um, attachment-based model. Oops. Um, an attachment-based model of parental alienation provides a coherent description of what we're treating at the family systems level, uh, at the personality disorder level, and the attachment level. At the family systems level, we're treating the child's triangulation into a cross-generational co uh, coalition with a narcissistic borderline parent uh, that is against the other parent. And the two impediments to the transition are an unprocessed grief response and a splitting dynamic of the narcissistic borderline parent. And I discussed those in the previous um, series, in the previous lecture. At the personality disorder level, we're treating anxiety management efforts of a narcissistic borderline parent through the projective displacement of the narcissistic fears of inadequacy and borderline fears of abandonment onto the other parent by means of the child's induced rejection of the other parent. And the narcissistic borderline parent is decompensating under the rejection of the divorce into delusional beliefs regarding the supposed abusiveness of the other parent. At the uh, level of the attachment system, it represents the transgenerational transmission of attachment trauma from the childhood of the narcissistic borderline parent to the current family relationships, 
Uh, the transmission process involves creating a reenactment in current family relationships of the childhood trauma uh, embedded in the internal working models of the alienating parents attachment system. Pathogenic parenting practices by a narcissistic borderline parent that are inducing significant developmental, personality, and psychiatric pathology in the child. Um, in order for the parent to use the child in a role reversal relationship as a regulatory object to regulate the parent's own anxieties and in which results in the loss for the child of a relationship with a normal range, loving and affectionately available parent represents the psychological abuse of the child. Therapy. Central to the understanding therapy is the misattribution of grief. The central feature of the child's experience in attachment-based parental alienation is the misattribution by the child of an authentic grief response. Initially, this grief is triggered by the loss of the intact family, but then this grief and loss experience for the child is increased exponentially once the child begins rejecting an affectionately bonded relationship with the beloved but now rejected targeted parent. Um, the attachment system, described by Mary Ainsworth here, uh, I define an affectional bond as a relatively long enduring tie in which the partner is important as a unique individual and is interchangeable with none other. In an affectional bond, there is a desire to maintain closeness to the partner. In older children and adults, notice she talks older children and adults, the attachment system is relevant across the lifespan. In older children and adults, that closeness may come to some extent, or may to some extent be sustained over time and distance and during absences. But nevertheless, there is at least an intermittent desire to establish proximity and, and interaction and pleasure, often joy, upon reunion. Inexplicable separation tends to cause distress and permanent loss would cause grief. An attachment is an affectional bond, and hence an attachment figure is never wholly interchangeable with or replaceable by another, even though there may be others to whom one is also attached. In attachments, as in other affectional bonds, there is a need to maintain proximity, distress upon inexplicable separation, pleasure and joy upon reunion, and grief at loss. In parental alienation, where's the child's grief response at losing the tar targeted parent? It's not, not there. The child shows no grief response. But the attachment system is going to produce a grief response. The attachment system is like the hunger system. It's a primary motivational system. If you don't eat, you're going to get hungry. If you break a parent-child bond, you're going to have grief. Where is the Maar de verdriet zit er nog wel, alleen het brein van het kind split. Dus dat gaat, dat wordt verborgen. Ook voor het kind zelf. Waarom? Het is gewoon te heftig. Dus dat zie je bij kinderen op latere leeftijd. En ik heb het zelf ook meegemaakt, dus ik weet hoe dat is. Dan moet je leren om dat verdriet naar boven te halen. Want het gaat zitten in je lichaam. Dat zou je zelf ook hebben. Stress gaat in het lichaam zitten als het wordt weggedrukt. Je moet luisteren naar signalen die je lichaam geeft. Dus in dit geval voor het kind om te overleven moet je dat verdriet wegstoppen. Want het is gewoon te heftig, te erg. Hij gaf het net al aan. Dit is echt pure kindermishandeling, een van de zwaarste vormen van psychologische mishandeling. The child's grief response. That's the critical question and that's where therapy needs to focus because it, once we get that grief response, um, everything's going to be resolved. The Kernberg talks about narcissistic processing of sadness. They narcissists are especially deficient in genuine feelings of sadness and mourn for longing. Their incapacity for experiencing depressive reactions is a basic feature of their personalities. Narcissistic borderline personalities don't experience that sadness. When abandoned or disappointed by other people, they may show what on the surface looks like depression, but which on further examination emerges as anger and resentment loaded with revengeful wishes, rather than real sadness for the loss of a person whom they appreciated. Ja, maar dus woede, ze ware woede wat hij aangeeft. Woede zit altijd voor verdriet. Dus dat verdriet zit er wel onder. Alleen zij hebben dat zo erg weggedrukt. Ook in latere leeftijd. En ze maken niet de keuze om het wel te willen ervaren. Dus ze blijven op anger niveau zitten. Normaal kan je voorbij anger gaan. En dan kom je bij 
het verdriet wat er eigenlijk achter zit. Dus de narcist en de borderliner, die weigert, en waarom dat is, dat weet ik niet, die weigert om naar zichzelf te gaan kijken, om daar wat aan te doen. En daarom is het voor psychiaters een van de meest vreselijke groepen mensen om mee te werken. Under the distorting influence of the narcissistic borderline parent, who interprets sadness as anger and resentment loaded with revengeful wishes, the child is led into a similar misinterpretation as the narcissistic borderline parent regarding the child's authentic feelings of sadness, loss, and grief as being anger and resentment loaded with revengeful wishes against the other parent. That the child misinterprets an authentic grief response as something bad the targeted parent is doing to cause the child's sadness. Because we hurt when people do bad things to us. So when the child is with the targeted parent, the child's attachment system motivates them to bond to the parent. But they're not bonding to the parent, so they feel a greater grief response and they hurt more. When the child is away from the targeted parent, over with the alienating parent, the targeted parent isn't there, their attachment system quiets down for bonding, so they have less grief response. They hurt less. I'm with the parent, I hurt more. I'm away from the parent, I hurt less. It must be something about that parent that's bad, because I can feel it for myself. I can feel it. And under the influence of the narcissistic parent who's telling the child there's something bad about that parent, the child comes to believe that. No, that's not true. That's not true. The reason you hurt with this parent is because you love them. For the kind, uh, what he aangeeft, a volstrekt logische reactie. Als ik bij de ouder ben, waarvan ik hoor dat hij slecht is, dan voel ik ook dat het slecht met me gaat. En geeft hij aan dat komt door die grief, dat verdriet, die rouw die je dan ervaart. Want je wil bij die ouder zijn, maar je moet hem ook weer verstoten. Dus het vermogen van het brein om te splitten en dan aan te geven, oké, okay, nou, dan moet je afstand nemen van die ouder. Dan gaat de pijn weg. Is volslagen logisch. You want to hug. You want to bond with them. That's why, it, and you're not allowing yourself to do that. That's why it hurts. The child has just acquired a misattribution of the grief response under the distorting influence. All therapy is, is helping the child recognize what's going on. No, that parent's fine. You just need to love the parent. And the moment the child bonds to the parent, the sadness and grief goes away and the child goes, oh, is that what it was? Oh, silly me, okay. And now we got a healthy family. So it's not all that complicated to treat. We just need to rebalance the child out of the distortions of the narcissistic borderline parent. So under the distorting influence of the narcissistic borderline parent, the child has just acquired a misattribution of the grief response under the distorting influence. All therapy is, is helping the child recognize what's going on. No, that parent's fine. You just need to love the parent. And the moment the child bonds to the parent, the sadness and grief goes away and the child goes, oh, is that what it was? Oh, silly me, okay. And now we got a healthy family. So it's not all that complicated to treat. We just need to rebalance the child out of the distortions of the narcissistic borderline parent. Had ik het toch goed gehoord, dan maak ik het wel heel makkelijk nu. De thera- de, als het kind in therapie gaat, hoeft alleen maar te horen van waarom het zich zo voelt. Maar ja, daarvoor moet dat kind dus ook duidelijk hebben dat de andere ouder dus doelbewust negatief heeft gesproken. Dus ik weet niet, uh, ik ben benieuwd wat, uh, wat hier gaat uitkomen. So under the distorting influence of the narcissistic borderline parent, the child interprets this rise and fall in hurting as evidence that it's actually the other parent, because I hurt more with you and I hurt less without you. Now this is the origins of what Gardner called the independent thinker phenomena, that the child actually believes that, no, it's me, I know there, it's not my dad who's influencing me, I actually believe this. Because the child has authentic, what the child believes is evidence of the bad parenting. No, 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 you know, it, it's actually because of the misattributed grief response. And once we get, understand this within psych, established psychological principles, I can then explain the independent thinker phenomena as what it actually is, a misattribution grief response, and then we know how to treat it and what to do about it. Um, so the central feature in therapy is helping the child acquire an accurate attribution uh, for their 
their feelings of hurt relative to the target of rejected parent. Phases of therapy, um, what we would call reunification therapy. There's basically four different phases that we want to go through. The first is the rescue of the child, a protective separation from the pathology of the narcissistic borderline parent during the active phase of treatment. Once we get treatment resolved, we reestablish re that. Then we recover the child's authenticity, we recover the parent-child relationship, and then we reintroduce the pathology of the narcissistic borderline parent. So the protective separation. Professional responsibilities require that the child be protectively separated from the pathogenic parenting practices of the narcissistic borderline parent during the active phase of treatment. First, because it's an appropriate professional response to the existence of psychological developmental child abuse, which we should take a protective response. Second, it's to protect the child from emotional, psychological, and developmental harm during the active phase of therapy um, of the child's treatment and recovery. So initiating therapy with children in this spot, special population without first acquiring the child's protective separation from the ongoing pathogenic parenting of the narcissistic borderline parent places a child at risk of harm from two sources. First, from the ongoing psychological abuse of the narcissistic borderline parent that's inducing these symptoms in the child. But also during therapy, if I'm trying to restore the child's normal range balanced functioning and the narcissistic borderline parent is trying to keep the child pathological, we're going to be forcing the child and we're going to rip the child apart psychologically. And so in order to oh, change the child, I need to... Hij geeft aan, kind zit in een psycholo wordt gewoon psychologisch mishandeld, moet uit het huis van de verstotende ouder. Logisch, want het kind kan niet en helen en constant worden mishandeld door die mishandelende ouder. To remove the pathogenic influence of the parent that will then allow me to restore the child's balanced functioning and then I restore the parent. Um, so the the breakdown of appropriate generational boundaries between parents and children significantly increases the risk for emotional abuse. This is Kerry. When parent-child boundaries are violated, the implications for developmental pathology are significant. Poor boundaries interfere with the child's capacity for progress through development, through development which Anna Freud suggested is the defining feature of uh, child psychopathology. Um, only Moore and Silver and talk about narcissistic use of the child. Only insofar as parents fail in their capacity for empathic attunement and responsiveness can they objectify their children, consider them narcissistic extensions of themselves, and abuse them. It is the parents' view of their children as vehicles for satisfaction of their own needs, accompanied by a simultaneously disregard for those of the child, that makes the victimization possible. Dus ook gigantisch veel grensoverschrijdend gedrag. Je ziet ook de narcissische ouder, de borderline ouder, zal heel controlerend zijn, zal alleen maar met zijn eigen gevoelens bezig zijn, die, wil, die luistert dus niet naar het kind. Het kind is gewoon een extensie. Het kind is er voor validatie van de narcistische ouder. The issues of parental alienation are not child custody and visitation, they're child protection. Um, the pathogenic parenting that's inducing severe distortions to the child's attachment system, personality formation, and a delusional belief system where the child is losing a relationship with a loving and affectionate parent represents a form of psychological development, child abuse, that warrants a child protection response. That, um, and so the presence in the child symptom display of the three diagnostic indicators shifts it from child custody and visitation <laughs> over to a child protection issue. The, um, we want to protect the child from being turned into a psychological battleground. Um, between our efforts to restore the child and the efforts of the narcissistic parents to continue the child's uh, pathology. The narcissistic parent will actively resist therapy because the child is serving as a regulatory object for them. The, um, and so it's not us who's turning the child into a battleground, it's the efforts of the narcissistic borderline parent to keep the child pathological that is uh, resulting in the destruction of the child. So turning to the child into a psychological battle, battlegrounds runs a considerable risk of harming the child emotionally, psychologically, and developmentally. 
standard 3.04 of the American Ethics, American Psychological Association Ethics Code says psychologists take reasonable steps to avoid harming their clients and patients and to minimize harm where it is foreseeable and unavoidable. Standard 10.10 .10 on terminating therapy, psychologists terminate therapy when it becomes reasonably clear that the child, client, patient no longer needs the service, is not likely to benefit, or is being harmed by continued service. Requiring protective separation of the child from the ongoing pathogenic parenting practices of the narcissistic borderline parent during the active phase of treatment um, meets the professional obligation to minimize harm where it is foreseeable and unavoidable. Without protectively separating the child first and trying to conduct therapy will either expose the child to psychological, emotional, and developmental harm by turning the child into a psychological battleground as a result of the continuing pathogenic influence of a narcissistic borderline parent in possible violation of standards 3.04 and 10.10a, or avoid turning the child into a psychological battleground by remaining ineffective, which would then require termination of therapy under standard 10.10a. The therapy itself, once we get the protective separation, we recover the child's authenticity. This involves processing that grief and sadness, helping the child rebond to the parent and learn that, oh, that's what it was. It was grief and sadness. Um, and so I would attune to the child's um, expressions of bonding, and I would misattune to all the narcissistic symptoms, um, all the pathology that the parent's a bad parent. No, they're not. They're fine. Um, we want to restore the child's empathy. Okay. Uh, that that's a critical feature, uh, that's a very concerning symptom. Uh, the absence of empathy has been associated with uh, the capacity for human cruelty. And so it's critical to the child's healthy development that we restore that child's empathy for the targeted rejected parent. Um, and so I, I, in my own therapy, I talk about issues of values, issues of compassion, those sorts of things. And as you do talk about those things or you bring up issues about compassion and empathy, I'll sometimes use quotes from the Dalai Lama or from other people. What I'm doing is I'm bringing this emotions through cognitive mediation. And so I'm, I'm decreasing the emotional intensity of their angry and bringing up the cognitive mediation and talking to the child about who do you want to be as a person. You don't want to be this angry, hostile. Fair. No, you want to be a kind person. And so helping them recover that empathy. Um, challenge their psychopathology. So when they're judging of the parents from this top-down kind of position or um, sense of entitlement or the haughty and arrogant attitude, all those narcissistic symptoms, I want to misattune to those. And when I get normal kid, I, I attune to that, which leads to the final point here, which is supporting the child's authenticity. Normal kids are annoying sometimes. Normal kids don't pick up their rooms. Normal kids don't follow parental instructions. I don't want simply to recover a child who's obedient to the narcissistic parent and now they're obedient to us. I don't want to place one overlord with the other. I want a healthy kid. And so when I hear normal range kind of healthy parent-child conflict, I'm going to take the kid's voice and say, you know what, kid doesn't want to clean the room. As long as the child is talking up to the parent rather than talking down to the parent, I will take the voice and bring it to the parent because that's appropriate. It's an adult talking to an adult. I don't have a child judging a parent. And then the child can hear me bring their issues to their parent in a mature and responsible way. And then the parent responds and I dialogue with them. And then I'll turn back to the child and talk about what the parent brought up. And I'll begin to help this family develop normal range conflict resolution. Ja, dus een kind hoeft niet te luisteren. Dat is logisch. Dat hebben wij allemaal niet gedaan. Maar het is anders dat een kind niet luistert en dan uh, tegen de ouder te keer gaat van uh, jij bent geen goede ouder. Daar heeft hij het nu over. Dus gewoon een normale manier van ik ben defiant als kind. En dan ga je samen met, met je vader of moeder ga je mee aan de slag. Solution that doesn't involve all this pathological judging and rejecting and all this other stuff. And so it's restoring the uh, authenticity of the family relationships that have been distorted by the narcissistic borderline parent. Um, restoring the relationship with the uh, targeted parent. In this, I want to revalidate the targeted rejected parent as a nurturing protective parent. And so when the child says they're abusive, I just, no, they're not. no, that's normal range parent. They took my iPhone away. Well, you're being a little jerk. You were giving them attitude. Parents do that all the time. 
That's not abusive parenting. And in doing that, in, in misattuning with their haughty and arrogant judgments that they deserve to be punished, all those distortions that are coming from the narcissistic parent, I misattune to those and I say, no, they're normal reigns. They love you very much. They just care about you. And, they, and I highlight that the moment I revalidate them as a protective parent, the child's attachment system turns on again because they're no longer the predator. They're no longer the threat. So the moment I say you're their normal range parent, the kid's attachment system goes on, and then all I have to do is just give a little boost to say, love them, boom, love them. The child's grief response goes away, and the child goes, oh, is that what this was all about? And I go, yeah, okay. And then we move into the final phase, once that takes place, which is to reintroduce a pathogenic parent. Kids love both parents, even the narcissistic borderline parent. Kids love them. In fact, the kid loves them so much they're willing to almost sacrifice themselves because that they realize that parent needs them. They're willing to submit to being a role reversal uh, narcissistic object to that parent because they love them so much. So we reintroduce that parent. Now, I do need to make a few adjustments to make sure the other parent doesn't distort them back into their pathology, but a few little tweaks and stuff about how to cope with that parent's kind of stuff. What do you do when the parent wants you to criticize, you know, the targeted parent and how do you manage that? A little coping skills on that. I think of it this way, is the attachment system is, the brain is like a computer and the attachment system is like a software program, like Microsoft Word, that's being downloaded from the more mature nervous system of the parent to the child's nervous system. And so we have a computer download of a software program, the attachment system. The problem is that in the parent's attachment system, there are some corrupt files with some bad code in them that are crashing the child's attachment system when they get downloaded. So essentially what therapy is, is we're like uh, Norton antivirus or McAfee. We're going into those corrupt files of the child's attachment system, doing a little cleansing, taking out a few of the, the corrupt codes, and then boom, the child's attachment system starts to operate again, and now we're going to reintroduce the virus Oh, we just need to put in a little virus scans and some stuff on the surface so that it doesn't reinfect the computer. There we go. That's the, th that's the therapeutic process. Um. Ik denk dat er iets te licht is hierin. Van oude, stop het kind weer terug bij de oude met borderline. En leren ermee te kopen. Want ga maar zelf nadenken als jij ooit een relatie hebt gehad met iemand met borderline of narcisme. Dan heb je waarschijnlijk ook je best gedaan om ermee te kopen, maar werkte dat? Hoe zit jij in die relatie? Dus ik, ik weet niet wat hier het antwoord op is. Ik zou zeggen weghalen bij de ouder met narcisme of met borderline. Mijn references at the end. That's me uh, on the slides. If you want more information, I have it on my website. There's information on my blog um, and my emails there. Now, I don't want to scare you away from saying, oh, this is professional boundaries of competence and issues and all these sorts of things. If you have watched this seminar and the other seminar, you are more knowledgeable than any other therapist out there. I've faced it and so I don't want to, we just simply need to know what we're treating. And uh, this, this framework gives you the support to know what you're treating so then you can do it well. If you have any questions, if you want consultation, there's my email address, drop me an email. Put in your title, uh, professional consultation, so it pops up on my thing. I will consult with you free of charge for initial consultation. You want to consult about diagnosis or treatment or something, to pop me an email, we'll talk a little bit. If you want to set up something longer, we'll, we'll talk about that. But initial consultation, I will just absolutely be happy to cons consult with you on this sort of stuff. I don't want to scare people away from treating who know what they're doing. But people who don't know what they're doing, yeah, stay away. This is very serious psychopathology, and it's hurting kids if, if we don't um, take care of them. So that's me. Qu open up for questions here. Great. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. We've got uh, probably more questions than I've ever fielded. Um, so I'll start with a few from the, uh, as I normally do, from the online audience, and I'll give you a, a chance to, to gather your thoughts here in, in, in person. Uh, the first question. When there are multiple children in the family, do, does the narcissistic borderline parent typically target one or more than one um, of the children? And as a follow-up, what are some of the factors that lead the parent to target that particular child or children 
amongst the others? They will typically target one because you notice the reenactment has three characters, okay? And so they will fill the three characters, abusive parent, victimized child, protective parent. Typically, they start with the oldest child. Now, that's not always the case, and it may be variable on different families, and, you know, a, a mother may have issues around the male child or father, and, or whatever it is. And so you may see variations of that, but typically you see the older child is the one that's targeted for rejection first. They're the, the child that's a victimized child. The other younger sibs are spared for the time being. Once this pathology is locked into place, then the parent and the alienating parent will grab the other kids and draw them in to this because it has to do with the splitting dynamic. For the narcissistic borderline parent, ambiguity is impossible. It's either all good or all bad. So if you are the ex-husband, you must also become the ex-father. If you are the ex-wife, you must become the ex-mother. There's no ambiguity. And so eventually, all the children will move into that role. Uh, this, this question just popped up as I was going down my list here. I thought it was interesting. During pr protective separation, does the child go with the targeted parent? Where does the child typically go? If there's no problem with the targeted parent, of course. There's no problem with that parent. This, you're fine. The child will display all sorts of um, protest. But that's only indicative of how severe the pathology was. All that protest was under the surface. And then once we do something, the child will display their grandiosity. They will defy court orders and run away from the parent. Court orders say you have to be over there. But I don't have to listen to court orders. That's your narcissism. I don't have to do And they will get very angry and display all of this. <laughs> But it'll calm down. And as it calms down, we then open up the grief response, bond to the child, everything's fine. As long as everything's fine, everything's fine. Is there potentially a risk, uh, physical, psychological, to the parent if they do not reject the targeted parent to the satisfaction of the narcissistic borderline parent? Is there a risk to the child if they don't reject the targeted parent to the, yes, it's a hostage situation. and. The narcissistic angry is, is referred to as narcissistic rage. It's angry combined with disgust. And for a child to get that signal from a parent of disgust mixed with angry, it's very disturbing. And borderline rage is just very hostile and very chaotic. And, and so the child living with a narcissistic borderline parent learns to read that parent and keep that parent regulated because it's survival living with that parent. And so when I, if that parent needs me to make displays at, at visitation transfers, no, no, don't make me go with that parent. I don't want to. That's what I'm doing because I have to live with this, this narcissistic borderline parent, and it's very dangerous. That's why unless we can protect the child, how can I ask that child to show love for that parent? Unless I... Ja, het is heel raar dus uh, als jeugdzorg gaat vragen aan het kind... Uh, van... En hoe gaat het? Weet je, het kind moet juist negatief zijn naar die ouder die verstoten wordt. Zonder training is het logisch, want het kind moet weer terug naar die verstotende ouder. Dus die krijgt dan weer op zijn laser. I can protect him from the retaliation of a narcissistic borderline parent who is absolutely tied into using that child as a regulatory object. Um, and so I have to be able to protect the child before I can ask the child to bond. So protective separation is essential to treatment that is in the best interest and doesn't harm the child. Uh, another question I thought was really interesting. Have you seen cases where both parents display narcissistic borderline behavior and are uh, almost simultaneously trying to establish a coalition with the uh, child? I have not seen that because very rarely do two narcissists marry each other. <laughs> okay. Um, but. Uh, I have seen distorted family processes where both parents are trying to get the child in a coalition and stuff, but you don't see the three diagnostic indicators in the child. You'll see a child who's messing up at school, a child who's acting out, a child who's using drugs, a child, all these other stuff, but you don't see the three diagnostic indicators under that case. The other thing I have seen is about 25 to 30% of my people who come to me because of my background in parental alienation is it turns out the supposedly targeted parent is the narcissist who says, um, I can't understand why the child would reject me. I'm wonderful. But the parent has no empathy for the child. 
And so the child is going, ow, it hurts to be in relationship with you because you have no empathy. I'm the wonderful parent. What do you mean? It must be the other parent who's turning you against me because I'm so wonderful. And, but again, in those cases, you do not see the three diagnostic indicators. You don't see the personality disorder traits in the child's symptom display. You don't see a suppression of the attachment system. The child still wants to bond with that parent, but they can't because that parent's a narcissist. And if you know what you're looking for, you see it in the targeted parent that, oh, you're the narcissist, aren't you? Um, and so, you know, the idea, and that's where it's so helpful to move away from Gardner and move, move into standard sort of psychological processes. Uh, we have a student who has an adult client that is the product, uh, comes from a high conflict divorce, but, but significantly in the past, years and years ago, mm -hmm. uh, displays all, all the indicators of having been the victim of uh, pathogenic parenting. How might, what might be some strategies for working with, with this adult uh, client years after the fact uh, regarding um, this dysfunctional system and his maladaptive beliefs. The critical issue on that goes back to that grief response, that they have an unmetabolized, unprocessed grief. And what happens in parental alienation is, what happens in normal range grief, parent dies, the child grieves. In parental alienation, the child grieves and so must psychologically kill the parent in order to resolve their grief. And so it's reversed. Problem is that parent's not dead. The parent's available, but they can never restore a relationship with that parent because then they have to overcome that, open up that grief and get through it. And so they just want to seal it over and keep it down. And so the, the, it, the early cutoff is likely to remain a lifelong cutoff because the person doesn't want to process it. But then they have this sadness buried in them. And so that depression or substance abuse or other issues will kind of co coalesce around that unprocessed and unmetabolized grief. So helping them process that grief response and recognize what it is, and then reach out and resolve to that parent uh, that was in the past. Okay, so you, it's not wonderful, it's not great, but at least you've opened up the ties and bonds and you can move on and resolve. Aloha. Hi. I'm uh, Willie Taguchi. Uh, I just retired from the, the Air Force, and uh, one of the things uh, in my training has been, been taught to uh, treat the family as a system, which you're a family mm -hmm. system oriented. And um, in, in this case, what I'm hearing is that you treat the child. Um, what's, what is happening to the parents while the child's being treated? Are they under also therapy as well? Yeah, I, in terms of the child, I treat the child and targeted rejected parents. So I'm working in the relationship. So I'm always doing family sessions between the two. Sometimes I might have a little individual session here and there. But for the most part, I'm, I'm dealing with their relationship. But I think it's also important, and I do am mindful of incorporating the narcissistic parent. Because the fundamental issue from the family systems perspective is the inability of the family to process grief and therefore make a transition from an intact family to a... And it's the narcissistic parent who's having that proce problem processing the grief and sadness about the loss of the intact family and what it means for their you know, self-esteem and all this other abandon. And so if possible, I like to meet with that parent and see if I can relax their stuff. In some cases, I've been actually been able to work with the two parents and work with the couple to help them process the meaning of their divorce and marriage so that we can metabolize that sadness without blame. And so move this family over into uh, uh, the separated family structure that's bonded by the child. And so that's the best approach. If I can work that and help everybody, then it frees the child and I'm not having to do that. Issues come up, though, sometimes with the narcissistic borderline parent who's in this delusional belief system that the child is being abused, and you know they filed three different you know child protective service cases, all of them unfounded. And you say all of these have been unfounded, and they say will say, well, they might become abusive. You know, yeah, oh well, you know, there's not much I can do with that parent, and so it depends on how flexible or workable that parent is, uh, the narcissistic borderline parent to resolve things. But fundamentally, my client is the kid. I need to make sure my kid's back on a normal developmental line. The other feature that's important on this in terms of taking care of my kid is that maturation processes go in phases of about every two years. So, you know, 8 to 10, 10 to 12, 12 to 14. 
if, I, if we spend too long treating this, kids are losing whole maturational periods with a bonded, loving, affectionate parent that are just messing up their later problem. So we need to get jump on this and get this done pretty fast. You know, I prefer within six months of getting everything solved, and then we can bring the other parent back in and, and move forward on things. Yeah, especially when a child is a symptom bearer yeah. of the, uh, what's been happening and uh, is there being brought up in that family. So appreciate yeah. your, your Thank you. guidance there. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I have a question about protective separation. Mm -hmm. How easy is that to achieve? given it's, the court system and um, it's right now it's impossible to achieve through the court system okay and that needs to change but it won't change until mental health begins to realize the nature and degree of the pathology and can speak with a single voice to the courts and say this is what we need for treatment now for me right now in terms of my practice ethical practice i will not treat a case of this without a protective separation. And I would recommend that to all therapists out there because we're putting the child at risk of harm. Problem is we're gonna have a lot of incompetent therapists who will. And so until we get the incompetent therapists to also stop treating, to recognize what the pathology, then if mental health therapists go to the court and say, you know what, I'm looking at these three diagnostic indicators, attachment-based parental alienation, treatment needs a protective separation, nobody's treating. The court will say, oh, okay, then we need a protective separation. That would be really easy to achieve. Right now, though, we've got to spend five, six years in litigation, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars spent on attorneys to try to get the court to separate, and then the custody evaluations to say, well, you know, it's going on, but what do we do about this? And so right now, it's a failed paradigm. Gardner's model is a failed paradigm. Once we switch over to an attachment-based paradigm, the solutions begin to emerge. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Lisha Lucille. Uh My question is, what if the targeted rejected parent really does have a problem like su substance abuse and the child really is a victim? How would this affect their diagnosis? The child will probably not show narcissistic borderline symptoms. They're not gonna show an absence of empathy. They're not gonna show a sense of entitlement. The child won't show a suppression to their attachment system. They'll say, I want to have a relationship with dad, but it's hard because he's, you know, alcoholic, or it's hard because he's it. And so one of my questions sometimes is, let's say I'm a pretty good therapist and I'm able to fix your, your dad. Would you then be okay with having a, and the kid goes, well, you can't. And I say, well, let's say I'm really good and I can. And the kid says, well, if you can fix him, yeah. Okay. And it makes sense to me. I'm seeing an alcoholic dad. I'm seeing a substance abuse. I'm seeing some sort of, it makes sense to me. I see, it's not normal range parenting. This is problematic. And so I'm working for my client, my kid, and I say, I see what, you, what you're talking about. Okay, I got it. And, and so I don't see, and it's not delusional, because the kid is a victim. That's not, so I don't see my three diagnostic indicators. And so now we're just dealing with normal range family stuff that we see every day, abusive parents, or that, and it moves out of this domain. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, we're up against the clock, but before we go, a couple of quick items. First and, and most important, on behalf of the entire university, I'd like to thank Dr. Childress for another... Oké, okay, lange, lange zit, lang geluisterd. Maar uh, dat is mooi met podcast, met video. Je kan in, uh, in delen kan je luisteren. Hij komt hier eigenlijk met een compleet oplossingsprogramma. Dus deze video is gemaakt in 2014. Ik ga ook naar het originele kanaal, geef een shout-out daar. Maar hij komt eigenlijk al met alle oplossingen. We zijn nu negen jaar verder. Nog steeds, eigenlijk ook in Amerika, niks veranderd. Ze zijn nog steeds bezig. Wat ik zie, is dat er gewoon een gebrek is aan competentie. Want je hebt dus een aantal psychologen nodig die hier bekwaam in zijn. Het wordt al beter. 2021, expertrapport, oude verstoting. Maar ook in het rapport, waar ik ook tijd aan besteed. Ik mis nog heel veel van de elementen die hierin voorkomen. Want wat zie je dus niet? Dat de verstotende ouder waarschijnlijk leidt, ja, ik denk ja, 100%, aan die persoonlijkheidsproblematiek. Narcisme. Borderline. Dus als dat niet wordt erkend... Dan kom je nog steeds niet verder. Dus ik denk dat heel veel ouders daar nog in zitten. Um, dit wat hij hier geeft. Ik denk zeker ook als ouder. Ook als jeugdhulpverlener. Hier ga je veel aan hebben. Dit kan je toepassen. Want je, kan je, eigen, je weet dus waar, bij je eigen kind waar het aan ligt. Dus um, ja, neem contact op. Als je je verhaal wilt delen. Ouderverstotingoverwinnen. At gmail.com Laat van je horen. Ook als jij... Uh, ideeën hebt van hoe kunnen we dit in Nederland 
veel sterker neerzetten. Zodat we eindelijk kunnen, dit, dit kunnen overwinnen. Het is een moeilijke weg, ik geef het toe. Maar als iedere ouder, als iedere expert die wel het lef heeft om wat te doen. Als we met z'n allen samenwerken, dan gaat het zeker lukken.